How big was that fish? Like, I don't. What do you think? Jack Thirty was inches. <laughs> it was huge. <laughs> I'm more concerned about animals than anything, but you know. Yeah, into some a, guys are animals. A bear or anything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We got off the river and I told him, I was like, I'm gonna go do this. And he looked at me and started laughing. And I was like, why are you laughing? And he's like, oh, you can't learn how to do this. <laughs> so naturally that of like, course, just, no. you know, <laughs> fueled my fire. Um, so I went out and I bought all my gear. <laughs> That's right, I just need a cameraman. That's why I invite you. I totally get it. Cause I'm like, I gotta have Chad with me. I got a good feeling about this trip. Being new to fly fishing relatively, three years of intense fishing, I mean, that's a lot of fishing. You get a bachelor degree in four years. So, I'm you, an expert. Yeah, <laughs> just kidding. Definitely. Hey guys, welcome to the Gritty Angler Podcast. My guests today are Miss Jordan Jones. <laughs> you might know her as Relentless Mama on social media. And Mr. Drop Jaw Flies, Jason Arvey. Welcome, Spider guys. Beer. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, last time we were all together, we were on the water. Yeah, that was fun. And Jordan uh, showed us up that day. <laughs> she did. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> you did. You came away with the biggest fish. I was pretty proud of that. I was stoked. That, that was, was a fun awesome. day. Well, it was cool to see you out there chucking big flies, too. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for showing me. You guys were great. It was my first time throwing streamers that big. <laughs> well, we took you to a secret spot, but... It's not an easy place to fish because it's a steep backdrop. Um, not easy to cast, especially big flies, and Jordan nailed it. Yeah, that was fun. Those big boulders, casting off those. Oh, that, <laughs> that was, was a great fun. time. It was a good time. Yeah. How big was that fish? Like, I don't, what do you think? Jack 30 was inches? <laughs> it was huge! <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this is a fly fishing podcast. We tell stories and lies, right? Well, it was pretty cool because you we just said, here, go here, do this, and you were just on it. You just did it. There was no help. What you She learned that knot that we do in what? First, second time that you saw it? Way faster than I learned it. <laughs> I tried. I'm like, I gotta that do this. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> that was so cool. Yeah. Well, I was just telling my wife, too, um, this morning. She asked who was coming over for a podcast, and I just told her how Jordan just, she learned the knot, she tied the fly on, she went down and fished, and we hardly saw her at all that day. <laughs> I know. She just tends to be how I fish when it's out. <laughs> you were probably thinking, that's all these guys do? This is easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but my point was there's no hand holding. Well, that was great. I really appreciate you guys taking me. Yeah. Even though it was like the longest hike down ever. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not an easy place to get to. Yeah. The hike down is fine. It's coming it's out. the way up, yeah. Especially after fishing all day and you're kind of tired to begin with. And then, oh my word, we got to do that. Packing enough gear to stay there for a week if we had to. <laughs> Those packs are heavy. <laughs> I know. Jordan's like, what in the world do you guys have <laughs> in your packs? Sure, I know. They were like the biggest backpacks I've ever seen. Well, we've kind of experienced it all from, we haven't had to stay there overnight yet, but we've run out of food, we've run out of water, we've had to filter water, I should really? say. Really? In the summer. Yeah, yeah. we guys yeah. play there a lot longer. In the summer, we go longer, we hike further, so, mm -hmm. yeah, we just, I don't know. The weather up there, too, it's, it's really inclement. You just never know what you're going to get. So, Jordan, have you been out on any cool fishing trips since? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, I wish I have. Need to. Maybe today might hit the Provo, something close, right? Mm hmm We kind of gave up on that. Did you? Or I have. I never I started, know. actually. I fished, the, I fished the Provo two times in my life. Really? Yeah. Okay. There's been a handful of other times. I've, um, I've loaded all my gear, and I said I'm going to go fish the Provo. And I just keep driving right by it. <laughs> and I don't keep stop. going. <laughs> I do. I just see all the cars and all oh, the people everywhere. there. Yeah. And I just drive right on by. Mm -hmm. Go find somewhere else to fish. Yeah. So Jordan, uh, Jason's been on the podcast a lot. But uh, for those that maybe don't know you, just give mm -hmm. us a brief intro of what you do. Okay. Um, so I started fly fishing about three years ago. I've done fishing my whole life. My dad always took us as we were kids. And I've always been like the tomboy. So basketball, fishing, anything outdoors was always me, oddly enough. I know most people don't see that when they like talk to me, but that's kind of what I do. 
Um, so three, three and a half years ago, I actually went out on a date with this guy and we went fly fishing and we didn't catch any fish, but I was just in the river and, you know, just learning the motions and it was just beautiful and so fun. And we got off the river and I told him, I was like, I'm going to go do this. And he looked at me and started laughing and I was like, why are you laughing? And he's like, oh, you can't learn how to do this. <laughs> so naturally that of like, course, just, no. you know, <laughs> fueled my fire. Um, so I went out and I bought all my gear, single mom. So I found like clearance men's gear. I still have it, like all this stuff, whatever I could to just, cause you know, the gear's expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and went out there and it took me, oh, it's kind of embarrassing, but a couple months before I caught my first fish because I didn't, I wasn't YouTubing or looking at anything. I was just out there just, okay, I'm gonna try this. Just throwing on a fly. I didn't know to like flip the rocks and to look at the bugs in the river or how to cast or where the fish were. And then what happened was um, I remember one day I was out there and on my, I was stripping the line in and I caught a fish and it was just by luck. Cool. But I was like, this is so fun. Anyways, and after that, um, I started reaching out to other people that fly fished. Spencer yep. uh, with Tacky Fly Fish, uh, one of my good friends. So I went out with him and he helped me a ton. Wow. Learned some of the ropes. And he's a good guy to learn from. Yeah, 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 he's an amazing fisherman. So kind of since then and now I go all the time. I take my little boy. He likes to spin fish though more than fly fish, so. Yeah, which is fine yeah, for kids. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, with kids, the the idea is just to let them have a good time. Mm -hmm. So, um, you like to go to the Provo? Do you have any other favorite mm -hmm. places you go? Uh, yeah, but I don't want you to say them. We <laughs> Chad, we're trying to set that up so we can get another fish. Yeah, spot right here on the podcast. Uh, I was in a. Right down the GPS coordinates. <laughs> I'll just right. drop you a pin. I'll just drop you a pin after. <laughs> Uh, no. no, but uh, the reason I ask is because some of the places you go, it looks pretty remote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the best days I feel like are those days, right? You go out and drive far, there's no one there. Yeah. And the best thing about my schedule is I can fish weekdays. So there's yeah. hardly any ever anyone out there, right? Yeah, us too. I mean, we don't, we don't go on any day that starts with Saturday or <laughs> <laughs> Friday. Or... <laughs> well, I know. When you guys said you would go on the weekdays, I was so excited. I can yeah. never find anyone to go out in the middle of the week. So um, today I kind of want to talk about, because all of us like to fish. All of us like to go backcountry. And uh, I know all of us go solo sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of wanted to get into two things today. One is, is um, women in fly fishing. <clears throat> I know Orvis just started a cool initiative in 2016 called the 50 for 50. And their goal is to help get more lady anglers out on the water. And I think their goal is by 2020 to have 50% of the fly fishers out there to be women. And it's so cool to see it being a growing sport. Like Jordan's been in it for three years. Um, I've talked to a few other lady anglers that just picked up a fly rod three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's growing in popularity amongst women. So... I want to know, Jordan, because I know, like, uh, Hutch from Orvis, mm -hmm. he goes to a lot of these uh, 50 for 50 meetings with the women. Yeah. And he said one of the biggest concerns that comes up at every meeting is safety. A lot of these ladies say, well, I would go if I had someone to go with, but I don't feel comfortable going by myself. Or if I go out by myself... I'm not going very far from my truck or my car because I just don't feel comfortable. Right. And then I see you, pictures of you out there, <laughs> and you look like you're in the middle of nowhere, and you're packing your sidearm. You got your, <laughs> you got your big dog. Um, a dog big enough you could put a saddle on. I know. No one will touch me with him. <laughs> that's awesome. Maybe that's how you, you just ride your dog in there. <laughs> I sometimes, sometimes talk on him. <laughs> Yeah. No, but what do you do that makes you feel comfortable going out by yourself? Um, so obviously my dog is a huge thing for me. Um, whether I'm, you know, women were nervous of animals or other anglers or anyone out there, right? You have to be aware of that. And I think for, you know, men out there, you guys probably don't have to think about it as much as we do, you know. Maybe you do have to be safe, but I mean, it's a little bit different, right? Oh, yeah. um, and so just being cautious, I love to take my dog. He's super friendly, but there's times he won't let people by me. Jordan, tell me, what's the breed of, again? So he's a gladiator. He's half Mastiff and half Great Dane. 
That's the coolest name, isn't it? I have Gladiator. a black Gladiator. Yeah, yeah, he's pretty cool. I know I want a second one. I'm working on that. <laughs> oh, my word. I'm going to get to. Um, but, yeah, he's great, and he's super friendly, and he'll come out and wade in the water with me, trained really well. Um, if I feel nervous, I'll call him out, and he'll just sit by me in the water. He's just great. Nice. So, um, so I had a question on it. I've never fished with a dog, but yeah. does, does that at all affect your success? <laughs> While you're Sometimes. fishing? <laughs> Sometimes it does, but he's totally worth it. Um, yeah. yeah, there's times he'll walk in front of me in the water, like right in my fishing hole. And yeah. it's like, oh, come on. <laughs> um, and also he knows when I get a fish on. He'll be way far and just exploring or whatever. And yeah. the second he hears me, you know, screaming or whatever, he comes running. And there's been times he's tried to grab that fish and <laughs> it Net pops it off you. or whatever. Yeah, and there's, you know, you lose him a little bit. But for the most part, he's pretty trained. Yeah. He's a really good dog. There's been times um, he gets stuck in my line. You know, when you're stripping out so much line and he mm -hmm. comes and walks by. <laughs> just... oh wraps around his legs. <laughs> yeah, but he's worth it. Um, there was one time on the river that he actually pushed me out of the river, wanted me to get out for something. And I, I think there was probably an animal or something nearby because he... And I was actually with Spencer that day, and I remember he was trying to nudge us out of the water and was barking at us and barking at the other side of the river. Mm -hmm. And finally, we just decided, time to go. That's really cool. That's awesome. That's like an so, episode of Lassie or something. <laughs> it was crazy. He, yeah. That's awesome. I don't know. I felt like he really has a good intuition. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so between the dog and packing. Yes. So on, I always carry my gun. Yeah. That's pretty good. I, you know, something that we do or everybody does is I, I would let people know where I'm going. And yeah. Is, you know how sometimes you go to a spot and it's not good? So you leave mm -hmm. that spot, but you told somebody back at home you were at point A. Yeah. So I always kind of say, I'm going to be here, but I could possibly be here too. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, 100%. Always tell someone where you're going to go, whether it's a friend or your significant other. Just, yeah, just but, let them know where you're going. But I got to get a gladiator. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to happen in this century, but... Uh, yeah. That's awesome. Well, and they have the Find My Friends app, and I don't know if you guys have ever used that, but sometimes when I go out, I'll send it, I'll just pick someone and say, hey, I'm going fishing, yeah. it'll track where I'm going, um, or if I'm going out of service, I'll at least tell them, this is where I'm going to be, if I don't call you by five or whatever, then maybe come look for me. <laughs> yeah. You know, another thing I think that's a, a good idea with, with how prevalent social media is today, there's a lot of so-called social media stalkers out there. But I would never announce where I'm going on Facebook, Instagram, you know, social media, Twitter, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'd never say, hey guys, I'm, I'm hitting the, the river today. I'm going up to the Duchesne or whatever. If I was a single female, mm -hmm. especially. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you probably have some, some stalkers out there. <laughs> There's been a few. It's been kind of crazy, but yeah. yeah, I try to be careful with that for the most part. So, so back to your sidearm. Um, you have a concealed carries permit, mm -hmm. you took some training, you practice with it. Yep. So I actually talked to Hutch a little bit about this before he goes out to like workshops. Um, just do how to get your concealed and different things like that. Um, but I went to a concealed class to get my permit where you actually had to shoot. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. I loved because they have to pass you off. You have to be familiar with shooting, how to, you know, um, load and unload everything. Um, but I usually always have mine ready to go. Um, and I know it's kind of weird and it is a concealed, but when I'm out on the river, I have it visible. Um, I tend to think people don't want to touch you if you're, or come close to you, if mm -hmm. they can see that you are aware of your surroundings and, yeah, you know, I'm more concerned about animals than anything, but, you know, running yeah, into some a, guys are a bear or anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, true statement there. <laughs> but really, I, I agree. There's not much to get in. Um, your concealed carry permit and being comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. My wife has hers too, so don't mess with her guys. But, <laughs> um, but I, she was nervous about it at first, but after mm -hmm. I took her out, let her handle it, she went and took the concealed carry class, just learned a little bit about firearms. What people are concerned about, people that are not gun owners or not familiar with guns, it's just that unfamiliarity, right? Yeah. Yeah. Once you handle a firearm and shoot it and you realize, hey, this is a tool and a weapon and it can't fire by itself, mm -hmm. I think people aren't as nervous yeah. about them anymore. Yeah. I agree. You know, and having them in the house, 
if my kids want to shoot it, I'll take them out and let them shoot it. So the curiosity's not there. Absolutely. Yeah, it's good for them to be familiar with it. Maybe not to have access with it, but I, I let mine be visible as long as I'm around. And I let them touch it. I let them handle it, unload it. Yeah. And so when they see it, they're like, I've already picked that up. I already know how it works. And then there's no problems. Yeah. But, but they do not have access to it. Yeah. You know. I agree. And Jason and I always <laughs> carry our sidearms, too. But, you know, there's that whole debate, and, and you brought up predators, right? I think mm -hmm. the real concern for anybody going deep into the backcountry is bears or mountain lions and predators, not so much people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's that whole debate out there, bear spray or a gun? <laughs> I'm not counting on bear spray. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan laughs. <laughs> well, I agree. Um, if I could only choose one, I'd take my sidearm. Mm -hmm. Every day. Um, I carry a bigger caliber and it holds 13 rounds and I just feel more comfortable with that versus a canister of spray that could malfunction, maybe couldn't work, or mm -hmm. say you had to use it and you emptied the whole can, then what? Yeah. You know, you're five miles back there and all of a sudden you have nothing. But um, <clears throat> I know a few people... Uh, this year that had bear encounters they used bear spray and it worked really yep mm -hmm. um, these were guys hunting not fishing but um, they used their bear spray they didn't want to carry a sidearm they said because of the weight it was just a weight issue mm -hmm. not so much effectiveness they they were really counting pounds because they were packing in for a whole week yeah whereas going fishing for a day I don't think that's as much a concern is is how much weight you're carrying on your person you know, and a third option, too, I know some people carry road flares. Just, really? Just as a bear deterrent. It's light. Um, I Start the I'm forest not, on fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not advocating it or saying I don't carry them or use them, but um, some, some carry two or three, you know, a combination of two of those, a gun and bear spray or a gun and a road flare, mm -hmm. and um, just to have a second option. Yeah. I could see that maybe carrying how like a bear mace or something would be helpful to have mm -hmm. just in case. I would rather use that if I had to than a gun for sure. Yeah, and <laughs> runners hope that mace. Yeah, stop them. <laughs> just out of curiosity, I got online this morning and I was reading um, uh, backcountry or what is it? Ladies solo back backpackers. Ladies that go out and do a lot of backpacking solo. There's a big community out there and a bunch of blogs. Mm -hmm. And um, they just had some ideas on staying safe. But uh, the consensus was, for most of them, they carry runner's mace, right? Mm -hmm. They carry mace. And they said, a lot of them actually say, I feel safer, you know, in the backcountry than I do walking through the middle of any major city by myself. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I, I would, I'm not a lady, but I can see mm -hmm. that they'd be right about that. Well, most yeah. people that are going in the mountains are going out there to be, you know, in peace and to do their own thing. I don't, you generally don't run into any, any issues out there, mm -hmm. I don't think so. Is there anything else, I was just going to ask her, besides Gladiator, Thor, your <laughs> gun, is there anything else you do, like, to stay safe or? Um, well, I mean, just be aware of your surroundings. Pay attention to what, what you're doing. I try not to be on my phone too much or, you know, I try to pay attention. Because I don't want to be the person that's just in the river completely oblivious or whatever. You know, it's, I think gotcha. it's good to be aware of what you're doing and what's, who or what's around you. Mm -hmm. Where there's a lot of women that maybe don't or they're staring at their phone or whatever, you know. I don't know. I was taught that by my mom who always when I was young was like, do you wear your surroundings, head up, look around. So. Do you ever go anywhere by yourself where you don't have cell service? Yes, I do. And I make sure I have my gun and my dog. Yeah. Every time I do that, I won't go anywhere without them. I know some people like to carry, uh, there's a couple devices you can carry that allow you to, that's not a sat phone. You got your spot devices or your Delorme inReach. And um, they have built-in safety beacons, but you can also send messages out via satellite. Hmm. And I know a lot of backcountry oh, yeah. hunters take them, <clears throat> and I'll be taking one to Alaska this summer, but... The spots, they're really cheap, 100 to 150 bucks. And it's not two-way communication. 
it's just one way. So you can hit, uh, you have a pre, pre-built in message that you send. Mm -hmm. And so for example, it says, everything's okay, going to bed, had a great day, good night. Mm -hmm. And then each night if you're camping or you're out somewhere, you just hit send and it sends it to whoever's programmed to send it to. Or you've got Delorme inReach, which is two-way communication. It's just like texting back and forth with somebody. Do you want that, though, if you're in Alaska and Lisa's like, Chad, I need you to get back <laughs> ASAP. <laughs> like, oh, <crap. laughs> I know. I was talking. <laughs> I had the same conversation with some guys yesterday on a podcast. Um, part of what I like about going remote and deep into places where the cell phone doesn't work is mm -hmm. just being able to unplug. Yeah. Right? You're not checking the news. You're not reading emails. Nobody can call you. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> but this is purely from a safety perspective. Say there's an emergency. You break your leg. Whatever. Mm -hmm. um, that's just an option that people have. They can pack. They're lightweight. They're built for people that backpack, hunt, and go to remote places. And of course, the, the third thing they all have built into them is an SOS distress signal, which goes to the monitoring center and then they dispatch emergency services. So if Jordan's five miles somewhere and she breaks her leg and can't walk out, no cell reception, that's an option. That is that's good. really cool, I didn't know about that. That's cool. Yeah, and I think really that is the biggest concern most people have if they're going solo somewhere remote, is just getting injured. I know, Jason, you and I, we always pack emergency supplies. That's part of what we carry, Jordan. I know, in those huge <laughs> backpacks. In our big backpacks. <laughs> I drink a ton of water, so mm -hmm. I do have a lot of bottled water, which is heavy, but it, I figure it's good exercise. We do have water filters, too, but what else is in there? Clothing, in case you have to stay overnight. Yeah. That's a big thing, to stay warm. Knives mm -hmm. for different things. Yeah, those take up weight, but yeah, it's good to be prepared. Yeah, you know. it is. I mean, that's just the key. So, Jordan, when you go out by yourself and you're you're going somewhere with no cell reception, you might be hiking a couple miles somewhere. What do you pack with you? Um, I always oh, obviously all my fishing gear, right? I um, I'll have like you said, knives. I almost always have a knife on me. Um, the gun, dog, waters. I always make sure I have tons of waters, granola bars, snacks, um, my phone. That's honestly all I ever usually take with me. I don't go out longer than the day most of the time mm -hmm. um, unless I'm with like a group. I don't go overnight somewhere yeah. ever by myself. So. <laughs> the problem Jason and I have is, we kind of alluded to this earlier, when we go out, we tend to go further than we plan to go. <laughs> you know, if we say we're going here, which is two miles we end up going four mm -hmm. or five and that's where we've run out of water a few times had to filter water so that's one thing we always carry is a water filter with us for sure if we could just catch the big fish in the first spot <laughs> there would not be any that's always how it is right yeah and that's the problem the good fly <laughs> anglers don't have this problem that's of right. having to go <laughs> Matches, you got to be able to light a fire. Yes. You got to have food, water, and then keep yourself warm, basically, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I always have um, what I call a little bug out bag, emergency bag, whatever you want to call it. It's about this big for those of you watching the video version of this podcast. And it's a little zippered pouch. But in it um, is some emergency supplies, first aid supplies. And then I always keep a lighter in there, um, my emergency space blanket, and um, I have a real small compact water filter that's in there too. Mm -hmm. So even if I wanted to drop weight and I'm going to hike another few miles, don't want to carry my big backpack, I'll grab that little pouch and a few other necessary things, stuff them in my pockets. Oh, my headlamp is always in there too. Oh, yeah, that's that's the other one, my headlamp. So all the emergency essentials are in that little pouch and I can stuff that into a pocket and keep going if I don't want to carry my 20 or 30 pound day pack. Yeah. 
And between the two of us, when we're together, we've got plenty of gear. <laughs> but like, if you go out by yourself, it sounds like you've got everything you need, basically, to yeah. stay safe. So I know there's a mental side to this, Jordan. Being able to just go out by yourself. And did it take you time to work up to being able to go further? Um, yeah, for sure. <laughs> or even go at all by yourself? Uh, the first few times. Yeah, yes and no. I was kind of excited just, just to be out there and just go walking and just to be in nature, honestly. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so, but then at the same time, there's times when I was like, oh, I want to stay out later, but it's getting dark. And then I would, you know, head out or whereas if someone was with me, definitely would have stayed a little longer. But I love going out there. Sometimes the best days are by yourself when you don't have any pressure to, I mean, I do all the social media stuff, right? So it's always getting that shot of the fish or it's always, that's always great, but the days when you don't have to worry about anybody viewing, you know, what, what content you're coming up with or how well you're fishing or what you're trying, because you can throw on something different and it can be totally wacky and crazy and maybe it works. I don't know, it's just doing your own thing. I think for anybody, there's a mental aspect to it. I've been on a few solo hunts and solo fishing adventures and I can't say I love being out there by myself because I don't. I love being out there, mm -hmm. and he just I'm not me to take fish picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you take someone else. <laughs> That's right. I just need a cameraman. That's why I invite you. I totally get it. Because I'm like, I gotta have Chad with me. I got a good feeling about this trip. Yes. <laughs> I'm gonna catch a huge fish. I need that money shot. <laughs> well, that is true. If you don't have someone with you, and you catch the big fish, and you're like, no, no one's there. Like witness. I know. The only solution I have, I don't, I don't put my camera on timer, but mm -hmm. I just take my GoPro and hit record okay. and set it somewhere. And <laughs> hold I've the done fish that up. before, yeah. No, but there is a mental side, and I think there's a lot of guys that don't even go out by themselves because they're just not comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And so it takes time to either get used to it, work up the courage, or you just have to put in the time to prep and plan and prepare to where you feel comfortable yeah and the last thing i would say along those lines is being familiar with where you're going yeah knowing the distance i always if i'm going somewhere more than a mile or two by myself i always take my gps mm -hmm. um <clears throat> just because i have <laughs> I don't want to say I've gotten lost before, but <laughs> what should have been a two hour trip turned into eight hours trying to find my way back. Oh, wow. And uh, in fact, um, I had a guest on the podcast yesterday. He was planning to go, what he thought was 10 miles on a raft uh, was actually 27 miles. Mm -hmm. And he ended up having to sleep overnight when he wasn't planning to be out there overnight. Because his boat was, his car was 17 miles the other <laughs> way. Well, and it took longer too because he was floating a river. Um, but the water level had really, really dropped. And he said he spent more time dragging his raft than he did floating. Hmm. And so it took way longer too. So again, if he, he says if he had done a little bit of homework, was a little more familiar with the terrain in the area... Um, he would have known, right? He said, fortunately, he does always pack a few extra power bars or an extra food. Mm -hmm. um, he was okay on water. And I guess gear-wise, clothing-wise, he was fine to be able to spend the night. He was able to make a fire. But again, just being prepared can help avoid um, mistakes like that or um, make you comfortable enough that you could spend the night if you had to. Yeah. That's crazy. That's a long, long ways. I know. Yeah. So kind of along with telling someone where you're going, make yourself familiar with the terrain. See, one of the things I do is I'm super impulsive. So like I have everything in my trunk ready to go majority of the time unless I'm going somewhere and it could get stolen. Then I pull it out, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I usually have my stuff in my trunk and there's a lot of times when I'm like, ah, oh, you know what? I got four hours three or four hours i'm just gonna go yeah and then you go and um but yeah i think that planning is definitely an important part there's been lots of times too even with your fishing gear you know you go up somewhere and you're like oh i forgot my one box of flies oh, yeah. or something that matters so so jordan what is it about fly fishing that you think appeals or would appeal to more women 
if they had the chance to go or actually went and did it? Um, so I've taught a bunch of people on fly fishing and I've noticed that women are more patient than men and they're a little more willing to like learn and to listen. Um, Accept help. Yeah, and accept help. Yeah, that's really true though. Yeah. Um, not that guys aren't, but I think that women have a really great ability to pick it up. And um, also for anyone that loves the outdoors, I mean, give it a shot and see what you think because being out there and being in the river, I have so many people that are like, oh, I would love to fish, like fly fish, but I hate fishing. I'm like, it's not normal fishing, right? It's you're out in the water, you're moving, um, you're changing flies. It's just a totally different experience versus just throwing, um, you know, some power bait out and just waiting. I don't know. That's kind of where I love fly fishing is I am always on the move and always on the go and I get bored really easy. So (laughs) fly fishing has been great for me for that. And it's also a really good escape. I feel like, you know, there's days that you get a little stressed and you have all the stuff on your plate that you're doing. And just to get out in the mountains is like the greatest escape there can be. And to come back feeling peaceful. Yeah. I watch ladies cast like you. And and really, good casters, it's more finesse than muscle. Mm-hmm. I find myself a lot of times when I want to try to bomb a cast <laughs> out there, I think I need to use muscle. Mm-hmm. And when I really try to give her, that's when my flies either smack in the water <laughs> in front of me or hitting the ground behind me. Because I'm trying to do muscle, whereas ladies, they're great at finesse and and just the tactic mm-hmm. and really smooth, great casters. They are. Mm-hmm. Well, and a really good option too for women wanting to get into it, um, or to join like local chapters or groups or even you know there's a group here in Utah on Facebook of lady anglers and everyone in there is so welcoming and nice and. You go out with them and it's not competitive. It's just, hey, let me help you or do this or try that. And everyone's super fun and it's just a really open environment, I guess. Right. How many ladies would you say are involved in that particular in that club? Or, yeah. uh, I want to say there's maybe 200 or so on the wow. Facebook group, Dang. but maybe like 50 active ones, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that are cons- consistently going fishing and they'll plan days and be like, Hey, I'm going to hit the Weaver this time on Thursday. Anybody want to go? And then cool. you kind of can join and go with them. Oh, that's so. really cool. Yeah. What's the name of that? Like, <sighs> I can't remember it. <laughs> that, that's what I was just curious. Well, I, I, didn't know. I think I it's just called shops. Lady Anglers of Utah, isn't it? Well, there's a few of them. I think I'd have to, I'd have to look at it, but like uh-huh. you can go up to the, if you, any state you're in too. You can go to a local fly shop and they'll know exactly where to guide you and tell you where to go. A lot of them meet. I know at a, what's a fly shop up in Salt Lake? Western Rivers. Western Rivers. They have, yeah, they have a women's group that goes. I've never been with them, but I know that they meet up there. Yeah, Yeah, and I bet, like you said, any state, if they just got on Facebook and did a search, there's, there's probably groups in every state. Oh, yeah. I imagine. And so if you don't uh, want to go alone or, you know, that's a great place to join uh, for the ladies. Jordan, you mentioned you're teaching fly fishing different parts of it. Do you have something coming up or anything on your schedule that you're going to be teaching soon? Um, In the summer, I'll take people out. And oh. I'll teach them just their first day, learn how to cast. Um, Not just, just ladies. You'll take yeah, anybody. I'll take anybody out. Oh, yeah, cool. um, we'll do either a half day or a full day, whatever they want, just to get the basics down um, and just kind of have a day to learn. Instead of me necessarily guiding someone, I will go out with them and help walk them through the knots and how to cast and stuff. So Cool. A little bit more of a learning experience so they can go out on their own after and feel comfortable. Gotcha. So, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, it's been fun. Chad needs a little help. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I thought you guys casting. I was like, okay, I got to get up on this level. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no. Anything I know is in large part thanks to this guy right here. Yeah. So it's really helpful to use someone like Jordan or if you have a good friend like Jason that is a great uh, fly fisherman, use them. You can learn different things from different people. Oh, yeah. I think that's probably been one of the most helpful <laughs> parts for me for learning is going with different groups and different people and you know you learn the euro nymphing or some people like to dry fly versus you know different ways of setups everything yeah so jason what tips would you give people now it's winter right it's cold snow a lot of lakes are frozen if 
just for people to practice their skill. You know what's always uh, funny is if you don't cast for a while, <laughs> like during the, you don't cast during the winter and then you go out in the spring and your, your timing's all screwed up. And I would say on the good days of the winter, like if you can go out on the lawn or the snow or whatever and make a few casts, maybe for 10 or 15 minutes if you can. Yeah. Yeah. So casting's the biggest thing. It really is. It is. It's just, it comes down to hours, right? The, you know, just time practicing casting. What's great too is each year, if you're able to take a big trip or two, like a week long trip where you're going to get into a lot of fish, you just think about, you know, if you're playing with a hundred different fish over a week long trip, how many chances you get practicing mm -hmm. landing fish, getting the drift right, stripping it, whatever. Just that uh, all the hours in that week is yeah. can really take you from here to here. I agree with that. It, it would, mm -hmm. Being new to fly fishing relatively, three years of intense fishing, I mean, that's a lot of fishing. You get a bachelor <laughs> degree in four years. <laughs> so I'm you, an expert. Yeah, <laughs> just kidding. Definitely. But I, I would, I'm curious, you know, what would you tell ladies getting in about casting? Like, what would you tell them to um, further them along quicker than maybe... Honestly, I go out with my little boy all the time when he's out playing outside and I'll just sit and cast. That's and we'll awesome. set out like a plate and, or we'll play like a game. And this is a good way to teach little kids too, even adults, how to cast and how to land a fish. Where we'll, you know, just go out and practice and it, once you hit it on the plate or whatever you're casting towards, the other person grabs it like it's a fish. And you have to figure out, okay, do I keep them on? Do I get it on the reel? Do I, how do I strip it in? Um, because that can be the most frustrating part, I feel like, once... You learn how to cast and you catch a fish and then you lose it, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Never done that. I, I wouldn't know what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was like, what? <laughs> <Bond moment. laughs> that's good. That's really good. You can take a Velcro fly and just send Thor around. And yeah, I could. <laughs> That would be a oh, really big mess. Be a good fish. <laughs> but that's good that's good advice. It is. Because casting really is the most frustrating part about learning the sport. And yeah. so people well, practice that. I spent time with you one time for about that's thirty right. minutes to practice my double haul and that was so helpful. So going Thank with you. someone that's a professional like casting instructor <laughs> can do that. It was very helpful. Yeah, and good student. You're. Uh, it's only five hundred bucks for half hour for a lesson with you. Well, that, when it's on sale, you know, and I just count my time. <laughs> but uh, so, Jordan, if people do want to get a hold of you, mm -hmm. how do they contact you? Um, obviously, any form of my social media, but I get tons of messages on there. So email is usually my best, and my email is right there, relentlessmama at gmail, on my Instagram page or Facebook or. Okay. Awesome. That's usually the best way. Awesome. So guys, if you don't already know her, you're probably living under a rock. But uh, <laughs> Relentless Mama and Jason at Drop Jaw Flies. Thanks for coming gritty on, angler. guys. And Gritty Angler. <laughs> Thank you if for If they're listening, me. they know me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, guys. And stay gritty. Although our native trout species are resilient fish, they are facing an uphill battle. Historically, there were 28 species of trout that lived in our waters, but three of those are extinct. According to Trout Unlimited's research, 13 of the remaining 25 species occupy less than 25% of their historic range. Six are listed as either threatened or endangered. Renowned conservationist Shane Mahoney recently said, quote, the natural resources in our country is what makes our country so great. We can have mountains and we can have streams and we can have forests, but if there's nothing living in them, they're meaningless. I agree. Let's not forget that our right to fish depends on habitat. Let's be good stewards of our fisheries and fight to protect and preserve our public lands. Our wildlife habitat depends on it.